Hi, I'm Devoki, and before we get into this Not My Thesis video, I actually wanted to do two things. First is actually just kind of explain the series. My channel has had a bit of a growth spurt over the past few weeks, um, thanks to some very like kind and generous uh, shout outs. And so some of you may have subscribed to this channel for bookish content and may be wondering kind of what this is. Not My Thesis is a series that I started kind of just a few months after I started this channel, uh, just to talk about grad school. I'm currently a PhD student in biomedical engineering at Boston University. I am a seventh year, which is like, really old in grad school years. I talk about kind of a lot of things that are just related to grad school. Uh, if you like this video and you want to check out some more, uh, there's a few that I might recommend. The one that I'm most proud of is the uh, mental health and grad school video. I'll link to these below. This is just where I talk about kind of my, my experience with anxiety and depression in grad school and like getting help for it. Uh, but it's also just a more general discussion about the issues in academia that I think uh, make this more of a problem uh, kind of just culturally than it needs to be. If you're looking for something that's maybe a little bit lighter, I might check out like a super unscientific question about weddings or uh, the greatest reality TV show of all time. So second, I'm sure for a lot of us, 2017 has been kind of a disorienting year. It's been bookended by like these major events, <laughs> like the Women's March in the beginning of the year, and then, you know, like all these sexual harassment allegations at the end of it. And there's almost this feeling of like a reckoning happening. And when you think about it, like on terms of like these scales of like global change, it gets to be overwhelming. But, you know, there are things that we can also do on smaller levels, just kind of on a day-to-day -day level um, that, that can be incredibly important. And so I just wanted to talk about kind of maybe one potential um, path to contribute to. This is related to girls in STEM and specifically helping girls from minority communities gain access and mentorship in the STEM world. A big part of the reason why I am where I am is because I grew up in a STEM family, which meant that not only did I get exposed to STEM and science and just whatever from a young age, I also had access to a lot of activities that helped me get into good colleges and ultimately grad school. But expanding opportunities for women in science shouldn't just be available to, you know, like people like me who have access to mentorship and activities built in literally to our DNA. And one of my friends at BU in, in the same program that I'm in, she has been involved with this group called E3, Empowering, Encouraging, and Eliminating Barriers. This is a student-run organization that was started by a high school student and that over four years has connected over 60 high school students with college student mentors from many schools, including BU, MIT, Harvard, Harvard, Boston College, UMass, Boston, and Tufts. Mentees often come from racial and ethnic minority communities, and through this program, they're connected to a wide range of opportunities, including college application workshops, tech company tours, science experiments, and career days, all designed to foster their interest and access to STEM. Mentees have gone on to take up research positions, internships, and earn scholarships in places in selective programs. E3 has even been recognized by Bill and Chelsea Clinton as a change-making group during the Clinton Global Initiative University Conference in October. All of this is to say that E3 is a really great program doing a lot of work to help girls gain access to STEM. But what I'm really most impressed by is that it's run by students. The board is made up of high school and college students. They've also made the program free for mentees and the funding thus far has come from the leadership team itself. Again, the leadership team is made up of students. I think the fact that they have been paying out of their own pocket for this for this group to make it happen is a really impressive indication of their own dedication to the organization, but it's also limiting to them and what they can do in this program. They've now started a GoFundMe campaign to raise money that will allow them to do everything from buying printer paper and food to affording meeting spaces and transportation, which will also allow them to be more inclusive and accessible to more potential mentees. Their goal is to raise $2,200. If you're looking for a way to make someone's 2018 maybe a little bit better than 2017, please consider donating to them. Even a small amount would be incredibly generous. Hi, this is Deboki, and today for Not My Thesis, I am going to talk about my bioengineering origin story. So about a month ago, I made a Not My Thesis video where I asked all of you guys to kind of help me out with a question. Um, and the question was, what do you think of when you hear the words bioengineering? And that video and that question was actually born out of a conversation that I had had with my advisor, um, where we had been just kind of talking about bioengineering and the field and really kind of talking about then 
what we think people think of when they hear the words bioengineering. I had kind of my certain belief, he had kind of his certain belief, and so I just kind of wanted to pose the question to all of you. It was not remotely a scientific poll or, or survey or anything, um, but it was something that I was just kind of curious about. So thank you to all of you who replied. I really, really appreciate all of your responses. For me, it was really fascinating to see how people came at this answer, because um, there was a wide range of responses, and some of them were like, things that I hadn't thought about, some of them were things that I kind of like was more expecting. So some of you, very generously, without knowing it, supported my theory, which is that when people hear bioengineering, many of them think of genetic engineering, which is definitely what I think of when I think of bioengineering. Others of you supported my advisor's theory, um, which is that when people hear bioengineering, they think more about instrumentation and devices, like maybe something that will measure something on you uh, or some kind of device that will help your body work in some kind of way. Like I said in my original video, there is no right or wrong answer, so even if you supported my advisor's theory over mine, I forgive you. It's okay. It's okay. You just broke my heart a little bit. No, it's okay. But in all honesty, bioengineering is a really vast field. So when I say there's no right or wrong answer, it's not some kind of like participation trophy kind of thing. It's honestly because people are still figuring it out. And it's, it has a huge impact in terms of how people structure programs for bioengineering, how people decide what kind of research to do in bioengineering. The lines between engineering and basic biology research are incredibly blurry sometimes because we're still figuring a lot of the things out that we need to actually engineer biology. So what was really interesting with for me, as well with a lot of you guys' responses, is kind of the different pop culture influences at play. And one of the common ones that came up that I didn't think about was Jurassic Park, which totally makes sense, especially like for those of you who are like in my age group, where like that came out when we were really young, and so you probably grew up with that. That still kind of resonated with me because my perception of bioengineering was definitely shaped by books and movies. One of the ones that I really remember the most, um, and this is not strictly bioengineering, but it definitely shape my view of it is the Spider-Man movies with to Tobey Maguire. I just remember this image of like the spider DNA going into his human DNA and just being like that is so cool. And for some reason the superheroes that I think I was most excited by growing up were superheroes who had some kind of like genetic component. You know superheroes like the X-Men. I just thought it was really cool that there's like this genetic explanation. I think it gave it the sense of reality or something that I found convincing, um, or at least interesting. There's also this series that I read when I was in middle school that I was like super obsessed with um, called Hex, um, which was written, written by Rhiannon Lassiter. And it was about these mutants who were genetically engineered to like be able to interface with computers. And again, somehow like somehow having that genetic engineering component to it was just super fascinating to me. I grew up surrounded by scientists. I grew up surrounded by scientists who do research with vaccines and like diseases, but those pop culture influences are the ones that I feel like shaped my interest growing up in ways that like I didn't fully understand until like I was like in my 20s. I didn't actually start college like aspiring to be a genetic engineer. I actually didn't think that I was going to be an engineer at all. When I started college, I, I was originally a chemistry major because I thought I wanted to do biochemistry. When I heard engineering, I, I was like, you make things. I don't make things. Like, I don't know how to make things. And like, that was just my thought process. So I was like, there's no way I'm going to ever be an engineer. But then kind of a few things happened. So one was this research that I did when I was a freshman. And this was with sea urchin embryos, um, developing a sea urchin embryos, where we were looking at the ways that genetics kind of give rise to complicated organisms. And this is actually really cool. And this is true for like, all species including us that are multicellular. Basically we all start like as a single cell, right? Like we're a single fertilized egg, we have one set of DNA, and then we become like these immensely complicated creatures with like a bajillion cells going on over our lifetime. And what's really interesting and complicated is figuring out how you can have one set of DNA, like basically one set of instruction manual for all of your cells. like. How, how do you how do you have like just kind of like one instruction booklet for all of your cells but then get cells that know which set of instructions to follow and that starts from that single cell that was basically the the project that i was helping with as a freshman undergrad um where we were basically studying how different genes interact with each other to to figure out which set of instructions each cell needs to follow and what's really cool about it and what i didn't like know until i started this project 
is that it's it, it's very much like a circuit. Like when you think of a circuit, when you think of like a light switch, you think of things that turn things on, that turn things off, that like have specific instructions um, that are all conducted by electricity. There's a similar thing happening with genes. It's just not like electricity. It's just that different genes work with each other to kind of turn some of them off, turn some of them on at different times. So if you've ever heard the word genetic circuit, what people are talking about is the ways that genes are able to control the expression of other genes through like the whole RNA and protein set of machinery. Sorry, I'm getting, I'm starting to get like borderline jargony. The other big thing that happened um, that basically ended my chemistry major career is that I took this chemistry lab class and I hated it and I decided I no longer wanted to be a chemistry major and for some reason, I don't know why, I was like, you know what, I'm gonna become a bioengineering major. The reason why this was an especially poor choice to make is that we did not technically have a bioengineering major yet. We had the promise of one, we didn't know if it was going to really happen, but I just decided to do it and somehow, all these years later, it's paid off. Even still, when I was a bioengineering major, I didn't think that I was going to be doing the kind of genetic engineering that I'm doing now, but a lot of different factors kind of work together to get me to the project that, my, that I'm at now and a lot of it is related to that sea urchin project that I was working on and a lot of that is related to the things that I read when I was like 10, which is kind of crazy to think about but it's also kind of what's amazing to me about pop culture in terms of like how we how we get to different parts of our life as well as how we understand and interact with science. I think that's part of what I found really like awesome and interesting about all of your guys' responses because pop culture is responsible for shaping so much of what we think about science and sometimes I think it does it really well and sometimes I think it does it really poorly which is not necessarily always about like accuracy like when I was watching Tobey Maguire turn into Spider-Man I wasn't like yeah that's gonna happen, we can do that. But I think what was cool about it is the way that it inspired kind of like an imagination of like, well, what happens if we start to mix different pieces of DNA together? It kind of invites you to ask questions that you might not think about asking. But I think even beyond that, um, especially when you start to think about other works like Jurassic Park or maybe Gattaca, which really start to question what we're able to do now that we have this increased control or understanding of biology, is the way that pop culture shapes our discussions about bioengineering. And again, I don't think that that's necessarily always a positive discussion or a negative discussion. And I think what, for me, what it kind of speaks to is a need to be able to combine our understanding of culture to give context to what we understand of science. I, I think as a scientist, it's really tempting to be like, no, nature is best understood when we divorce it from, you know, the context of society, when we kind of divorce it from the subjectivity, I guess, that we associate with people. But I think it's really important to be able to link these things together. I think being able to give cultural context to what you're doing, both for why you're doing it and what the potential consequences for it are, um, is necessary. I think science is actually kind of dangerous otherwise. That's why when I think of these kind of pop culture influences, even if they're just kind of fun, lighthearted, or silly things, I think they're they're necessary. Not necessarily to have the most profound and deep conversations, but just to have some kind of conversation. I had a script for this video, but I am like so way off of it at this point. I'm just kind of rambling out loud, sort of like my thoughts on bioengineering, which might just be because I'm sort of like nearing what seems to be the potential end of my bioengineering research career, even though that does not mean that I am like done with bioengineering. But I have just been thinking out loud, both kind of like how I got into it and kind of its place in the world, I guess. Maybe if we kind of want to continue this conversation, I would definitely be interested in hearing more, I guess, about the pop culture influences that maybe have shaped your idea of science um, at large, not just bioengineering, because I think like there are tons of shows that I remember watching when I was a kid growing up that like were explicitly about science like you know the magic school bus but there's a lot of other things as well like you know comic books and movies and stuff so I would love to have like more of a conversation about those kinds of influences below so yeah let me know maybe you're like your top like fictional scientist or something that you knew growing up so thank you guys for watching and yeah bye